Good afternoon, everybody. This is Mike Talbot. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of UK Mediation. And I'm here this afternoon to lead our webinar on becoming a workplace mediator. So hopefully everybody's hearing me okay. It's uh, your chance to get your speakers set correctly um, and to settle in for our webinar. I'll be talking for about 40 minutes, 35, 40 minutes. So here we go. We're about to get started uh, with our webinar. So just a quick word about me first, uh, Dr. Mike Talbot. I'm the um, founder of UK Mediation. I started this about 19 years ago. Uh, on the back of uh, working as a psychotherapist and a consultant for a number of years and getting interested in conflict. So I come to conflict from uh, the angle of the psychology of conflict, what happens uh, beneath the surface, how come we get into conflict, how come we get stuck there, how come it's so difficult to manage, and uh, what is it that we need to do in order to resolve it. So that's my background briefly as, as a psychotherapist and a mediator and a trainer. Um, having started this company about 19 years ago. So today we're talking about becoming a workplace mediator. Now, workplace mediation is one of the biggest areas uh, of mediation practice. It's one that we specialize in. So our particular interest is in resolving interpersonal disputes in the workplace, um, any kind of fallouts, grievance type issues. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about this afternoon. So let's have a look at what it's all about. First of all, I'd like to be talking uh, about the nature of workplace mediation, what it means, what it is, and what it was it what it isn't. Um, so we'll have a, a bit of a look at what it's all about and talk about how workplace mediation is currently provided. So I'll, I'll mostly be making reference to what happens in the UK. We have worked in several countries around the world, and there's more similarities than differences, but of course, uh, there may be some things that are unique to your own setting. I'd be very interested to hear. Uh, in the chat boxes if there is anything that you find is quite different where you are compared to what I'm talking about. Um, I'm also going to be talking um, about, uh, importantly, the seven joys of being a workplace mediator. So I, I, I sat and thought, what, what, what can I really say about being a workplace mediator? And I thought, let's, let's make reference to the first seven things that come to mind. So my experience is really of having done some hundreds of workplace mediation cases and of provided supervision and consultative support and mentoring to um, uh, a similar number of mediators, actually. So let's talk about the, the joys of being a workplace mediator. And then down to brass tacks, how you train, how you get experience, and how you gain credibility as a mediator. How can you get into this interesting field? What is it that you need to do to, um, you know, to get, into a, get to a position where you're ready to offer workplace mediation? And then at the end, I'll talk about how we can help, what it is that our company can offer you if you're thinking of becoming a workplace mediator yourself. So that's how we're going to be spending the next um, the next 35 minutes or so. Here we go. So workplace mediation, what's it all about? Well, I think it might be a good idea um, if we can, uh, you know, take a look at a conflict and think about applying workplace mediation to a conflict. So I can show you, um, I'm going to show you a brief clip of a workplace conflict. So a very brief setup first. The, the clip is only about two minutes long, two and a bit minutes long. Uh, we have two workers. We have these two people, Andy and Letitia, in a workplace who've fallen out to do with a report that they're both supposed to be writing. And the report is to do with his college course. Letitia is a longtime worker in this uh, organization. Uh, who stayed up, she's collaborating with Andy on this report, and she's stayed up late to get her part of the report completed. So the two of them meet uh, in the kitchen over a morning coffee break, and the subject of the report is raised. And as you'll see, uh, there's some conflict, there's some misunderstanding between the two about this report and about her contribution to it, uh, and about some uh, basic underlying issues between the two of them. Um, that afterwards, we're going to have a look at how they might be addressed, if they could be addressed, using workplace mediation. And you're going to hear these two guys um, in the kitchen meeting and having their conflict in connection with this report. Hi, Andy. Hi, Letitia. So you'd like a cup of tea? Um, no, I'll use my own if that's all right. Oh, I prefer that. You sure? Yes, thank you. Oh, OK, then. All right, so how's it going at work now? Very busy, mm. and the college course is going very well, mm -hmm. but that's what I expected it would mm. be. Right, so have you made some sort of friends on the course? Or? Yes, I've got a good group. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 
Oh, great. I'm looking forward to lunch today, though. The team's meeting and we're all having lunch together. Actually, I'm going to give that a miss. I, uh, I'm going to meet up with the guys from college, the ones I'm doing the report oh, with. Oh, Andy, that's a shame. We actually planned to meet today and meet for lunch. and So that was prearranged, wasn't it? it? Well, I didn't think anybody would mind. And I think probably this is a bit more important to meet up with them. That, oh, we that report might. is very important. I actually worked extra hours to complete the report so we could actually meet for lunch today. So yeah. it's quite important. Um, and uh, even Jackie's coming and she, you know how busy she is. I mean... Actually, last week when you were not there, I, yeah. I read the report. It was on your desk, and uh, I thought, well, well, I'll take the opportunity, mm. which I did. Right, okay. um, and I've decided uh, we're not going to use it. You're not going to use the report? No, no. Um, it really wasn't what I wanted, and I'm not sure it'll fit with what we're doing. So I, I decided wasn't not what to you use wanted, it. And no. You didn't think it would fit? No. I don't understand. What, what are you saying? Don't take offence, but I've decided that we're not going to don't use it. Don't ask me it. not to take offence. Please don't ask me not to no. take offence, because I am going to take offence, because I think, basically, you don't think the report is good enough. No, I mean, not get angry about it. Well, it's not I'm, that important, I am, honestly. I find it very difficult to remain calm if you're insulting my work. Well, no, I'm not insulting you. Well, that you mean... are by saying that you don't want that piece of work in your report. You have all these high-flying ideas because you're a graduate. It's so theoretical you think you're superior to everybody else in the team. And you just, you know, you insist on making your own tea. You don't want to come out to lunch with us. You don't want to do anything with us. It's all your fault. You just like that because you're such a prat. That's basically clear. And you may not think lunch is important. And you may not think the report is important. But I do. And I'll tell you something. Jackie will. And I'm going to see her right now. So there we go. That's the Andy and Letitia story. A bit of a conflict there between two colleagues around a misunderstanding to do with the report. And in particular, a bit of a personality clash there. We've got... Uh, the lady who's been there a long time, the fellow who's come in with a degree under his arms, and uh, a bit of a, a bust up there about a mutual understanding to do with the report. So these are the kind of situations that would be um, well suited to being addressed with uh, workplace mediation. So let's have a look at what it's all about. Those of you uh, on the webinar today, some of you we know may have had experience of mediation before, workplace mediation, uh, maybe some of you less so. Um, but let's have a look how workplace mediation might work in this case. The point about the mediation is it's a way for a neutral person to get involved and to try and bring about a better and more constructive conversation between two people. Um, we can get people around the table um, and in a better setting than at the kettle at coffee break um, and try and bring about a more uh, constructive conversation between the two. The chances are, in the situation we saw in the kitchen there with Andy and Letitia, the chances are uh, that may progress into a grievance. There's some name calling goes on in the video. Um, it may progress into some disciplinary action if there was any um, activity by the two of them that was investigated. A conclusion may be disciplinaries. Um, and what we're trying to do with mediation is to preclude the need for any sort of formal action such as grievances or disciplinaries, uh, trying to avoid the need for the organization to go into the formal stages and trying to get an early informal resolution uh, to these kind of conflicts and bust ups between people. So the uh, point about mediation is when done well is that it transforms people's working relationships. So there's a, an, a misunderstanding there in the video clip about a report and about who should be doing what and whether the report should have been looked at on the desk. Um, and uh, the goal of workplace mediation is to transform the working relationship just to address more than just the immediate dispute because that's something that could be done easily by the manager who can arbitrate who can listen to both sides and tell people what they're going to have to do who can take a look from a more of a managerial arbitrated point of view but with mediation we're trying to get a dialogue going quality dialogue to the point where the relationship becomes transformed they get a much a better understanding about the other, where the other one's coming from and we're trying to address more than just the immediate dispute. It's more than problem solving. It's more than uh, the managerial intervention. It's rather more paying attention to the working relationship at its heart. The essential characteristics of workplace mediation um, are very importantly, it has to be voluntary. Can you imagine trying to force these two guys into mediation? If we push people into things, the first thing they're going to want to do is push back. So it's very difficult to... Um, 
require or cajole people into mediation. It has to be that they want to do it and that they have the, the intention and their own inclination to try and fix their working relationship. And people really can't be forced to take back the, uh, to take part. They just push back if you try and push them into it. To get people to open up, to get people to be open and honest with each other, we need to keep a very private setting around the mediation. So we define it as being confidential. We have a, a strict understanding around the confidentiality um, and no record of the meeting is retained and the disclosures are minimal. So we may disclose back to the referrer of the case that agreement's been reached if the parties are happy. And we can also say that here's some points of the agreement if they're happy to disclose them. Um, and if there's any improper conduct or anything that comes up against the organization policies, then there may have to be a disclosure. But ultimately, what people say and what people do in mediation is kept private. This means they can open up. This means they can talk more candidly with each other. This means we can get to the heart of the matter. And the third essential um, condition really for me workplace mediation to work is that it has to be future focused. So we're trying to get away from what would happen otherwise in your stage two grievance or in an investigation or in a disciplinary matter. We want to get away from digging into the past, taking an evidential view of what's going on. We want to more pay attention to the future of these two's working relationship, getting away from blame, moving away from fault and looking more at the shared responsibility they have for making the situation better. So very much we go in with this frame. The frame of workplace mediation is that we're looking at what the two people can do from today forwards. Um, they're going to want to talk about the past, and the, the lady in the DVD is going to want to talk about the fact that Andy read the report when it was on her desk, and he's going to want to talk about the fact that she called him a name when they were in the kitchen. Um, but what we're, we're, we're making the frame focus on is more to do with the future of their relationship rather than the past and any allegations of blame or fault, who's right or wrong. So these are the essential conditions for workplace mediation to work. So you may know that already. Uh, and we'll talk now about how workplace mediation is provided. So if you've ever in your organization brought in an external mediator, or if you have mediators yourself within your organization, um, you know, this is these are the comparisons that I'm just going to make reference to now. Um, about the two ways that workplace mediation can be provided. So the first thing would be if you've got internal workplace mediators. So you may have people uh, in your organization, the organization already, or you may be thinking of training some people up internally. And the way they would work would be as part of a mediator panel. So you may have 10, 12 people within the organization who are there. And in addition to their day job, they work as part of a mediator panel. They can be called upon with mediation referrals uh, and attend to any workplace disputes. Their referrals would come through a case manager or case coordinator, so there would be a named individual uh, within the organization. It's often somebody within the HR department, but doesn't have to be, um, who can uh, manage the referrals, who can be the gatekeeper for the service, who can talk to potential referrers as well and make sure that you're getting suitable referrals and then pass these cases on to uh, the internal mediators. The internal mediators, typical uh, organization that would have an internal panel, would usually be 500 plus employees. Um, a lot of the organizations we've worked with are larger private sector organizations, especially distributed um, <coughs> with branches all over the UK or, or internationally as well. Uh, local authorities, <coughs> NHS trusts, um, the emergency services and universities. So these are larger employees. And within those places, in the many, many places we've set up internal panels, the mediators might be doing five or six cases a year. So it's enough to keep your hand in. It's enough to um, uh, not to take you away from your day job um, uh, excessively uh, and enough to keep the service running. Often the mediators will work in pairs. So because you're not doing all that many cases and because it's good to embed the skills following the training and to have the, the backup of a co-mediator, um, it's quite beneficial to work in a pair with a co-mediator on any dispute, um, but particularly disputes involving more than just two people. So these would be the characteristics of the internal workplace mediation um, setup. Uh, a panel of mediators who are coord whether referrals are coordinated through a dedicated case manager, um, half a dozen cases a year, uh, and often working in pairs for the backup, for the support, for giving and receiving feedback, and especially early on after the training um, for actually embedding the skills and getting good at doing workplace mediation.
And the alternative, of course, and especially for smaller organizations, is to have external workplace mediators, so people who come in as needed. So it could be expert mediators from somebody like us. It could be freelancers who work across several organizations. Tend to be more experienced because the external mediators, this is probably all they're doing, or it's mostly what they're doing. So they're doing mediation all the time. So whereas your internal mediators will be doing five or six cases, the external mediators might be doing many more than that. They tend to be more experienced because they're doing a large number of cases per year and consequently they might be working alone. So buying in an external workplace mediator when you need them um, might be a more experienced mediator, somebody who just does this for a living um, and does a large number of cases a year. So you've got the internal, you've got the external and you can imagine that there might be um, an effect of that in the eyes of the participants. So thinking back to the DVD clip, you've got these two fellows who've fallen out to do with a report, to do with poor communication, to do with a name call, um, to do with the way that they're communicating. Clearly, there's quite going, a lot going on there. Clearly, other people in the organization are going to know about it. So it could be cleaner, it could be neater to buy in an external workplace mediator for this. Um, alternatively, if it's a large organization, as the, the, the organization illustrated actually is, um, then there may be a panel of mediators internally and none of the mediators knows either of the participants. So if the organization is big enough, we can be sure that they haven't come across or they haven't got an ongoing relationship with any of the internal mediators. And it might be appropriate and certainly less expensive and possibly a quicker response time to actually use one of the internal mediators instead of an external. So quite a few pros and cons there. And another thing is about the confidentiality, which is although with internal mediators, you can give cast iron assurances about confidentiality. Sometimes people don't believe it. They might be quicker to trust and more readily, more ready to trust that an external mediator, somebody they've never met before, who's got this arm's length um, relationship with the organization, that they might be more inclined to maintain the confidentiality. But it's, it's in the eyes of the beholder, really. So there we are. That's sort of the, the, the brass tacks, really, about mediation and how it might be provided with internal or external mediators. And I thought I'd tell you something today about what it's like to do workplace mediation. And I, I, I drafted a few lists and I thought, well, OK, let's think about uh, the bits that I actually enjoy about doing workplace mediation. What would they be? So I called it the seven joys of being a workplace mediator. What do I find interesting or exciting or stimulating about actually doing this work? One of the first things you have to do when we meet people who are in conflict is we meet them separately. We spend a bit of time separately with each individual. and We find out the situation from their individual perspective. They're only going to open up if you can very quickly build that rapport with them. So within the space of an hour and a quarter, hour and a half, sitting in a room privately with this individual you'd never met before, we need to fairly quickly get on board. We are expecting or hoping that people are going to open up and tell us what's really going on in a, in a fairly open and honest way. And the, the challenge, the early challenge when we meet people is establishing that rapport can be quite tricky because they're going to be suspicious. They're going to be um, maybe unfamiliar with this kind of process. So a bit of a challenge there right early on. Great thing is to work with a trusted co-mediator. I enjoy working with um, co-mediators these days. I, I, there's several of our mediators that I've been working with for 10, 11 years. We get to know each other pretty well, we get to anticipate what the other one's going to do. If you can partner up with a trusted co-mediator, that's a, a real joy about doing workplace mediation. The, the boundaries with which we provide mediation are really important. So what I mean by boundaries are the mundane things like the confidentiality, about the impartiality of the, of the mediator, about the fact it's future focused. But importantly, a uh, boundary is about what's the purpose of the intervention. So um, a, an interesting thing about workplace mediation is when we go in there, we have to be really clear with people what we're there to do and what we're not there to do. So I'm not there to arbitrate or to decide who's right or wrong or to tell people what to do. Uh, I'm not there as a counselor, um, albeit if you caught the start of the uh, of the webinar, I mentioned that my background is in psychotherapy. So I've got to be very careful to turn that off and turn on the mediator or put on the mediator hat and keep really clear boundaries about what we're there to do, what the role of the participants has got to be and what the role of the mediator is going to be. And when we are really clear about those boundaries and put those in uh, repeatedly, uh, it really helps us not to get distracted uh, by other imagined roles of the practitioner. 
it helps us to get away from this idea that we're going to be telling the participants what they've got to do or we're weighing it up or deciding who's at fault. Keeping those boundaries clear um, is actually a joy and makes the workplace mediation far more successful. There's going to be some tension when you get your two parties together. So working with that early tension in the room, the interpersonal tension between the two parties, when they are faced with one another in a confidential environment with a mediator with whom they've spent some time that morning, and the first time they turn and eyeball each other and have to actually open up about the issues that have been bugging them about the other party for all this time. Um, it's an interesting situation. It's a, it's a great situation to be working with. We can start to see a shift when they begin to open up, when they begin to have their conversation. So initially in a mediation, what I find is that you're having a lot of conversation with each participant separately. You do that in private, but when you get them together, uh, even though they're in the room together, they would be inclined to talk directly to the mediator. But when they start to turn and face each other, when they get through the initial sort of tension and they start to open up to each other and start to have their conversation, it's a, it's a magical moment in a mediation. And what we do then is build our, use our skills to actually build the dialogue and get, get the momentum of the dialogue going to the point where they're talking for about 80% of the time and the mediator is talking for about 20% of the time. So what happens is when we've got through that initial tension, when they're really clear about what they're there for, and we have this trust and a bit of rapport with the parties, what they start to shift, they start to open up to each other, they start to get into a dialogue to the point where the mediator, if, if it's gone well, the mediator becomes redundant. The mediator is there more or less just keeping the, the direction of the conversation going, but more or less leaving them to get on with it. And at the end of most successful mediations, which is my number seven joy, is about watching the backs of their heads as they walk away. I, I say to uh, the mediators that we've trained, and we've trained just over 5,000 mediators in the last 18 years, just by the way, I say to them, don't do it for your own ego needs. You won't get many pats on the back for doing mediation. They don't turn around and say, thank you ever so much, that's great, that's really helpful. What they do do, which is a great success, is they're so distracted with talking to each other and having this very overdue conversation that they've not been able to have for months or years in some cases, um, that they forget to turn back to the mediators and go, cheers, thanks for that. So it's, it's a funny moment. It's a moment I enjoy where the parties actually walk out and all you're doing is watching the backs of their heads as they walk away. They're too distracted with their own conversation uh, to be bothered with you. So that's a, that's a result. So there's a few joys of, of doing mediation. So I've talked about uh, what it is and how it gets provided. Um, and then some of my sort of uh, uh, quirks uh, about what I like about doing workplace mediation. Let's talk now about some of the nuts and bolts about how you train, how you get experience and how you gain some credibility as a mediator. So I'm guessing that uh, many of the attendants on today uh, are thinking about getting into this field. Um, so this might be the bit that you um, you want to hear about how you get in here, what training you need to do. So the training, well, first of all, I would suggest you get a proper qualification. So there's a lot of people offering mediation training. Uh, we've gone straight to the top. We get our um, uh, accreditation externally through an awarding body. Our units, our qualifications are on Ofqual's framework. Ofqual is the regulator examinations in England and Wales. Uh, and we have a level four qualification. So it sits alongside um, A-level's first year of degree. So level four is around about the same level of complexity as the first year of an undergraduate degree. Um, recognized across the European Union and future proofed. So that gets you to the point if you pass our assessment and if you work in the right way, I'll come on to some of that, that gets you accredited mediator status. So I would strongly suggest if you are training, you only train once as a mediator, so make sure you get a proper qualification. And this is what we offer. The only level four is externally accredited and you can gain accredited mediator status by doing it. Um, if you are looking at training as a freelancer, as an individual, then what you probably want to do is to attend one of our public courses. We do open access courses all year round. And we will send you after the webinar a list of where those courses are running. But if you're an in-house mediator, or if we're talking about a, a panel of in-house mediators, what we do is we come to you. So we provide a whole package. We'll train your group of mediators. We can even do a selection process for you. We'll provide you everything you need to get started, including templates for tape, uh, paperwork, templates for, for leaflets, how to publicize the service, plus post-course support. So what we'll do is for a year, remain available as you start to take on your first cases. Um, there'll be a lot of questions that come up when you do start to do your first few real cases. 
and we're available by phone and email for anything you want to ask us as you start to get um, uh, get stuck in with your first year of running your in-house mediation service. So for freelancers, people who are thinking of setting up on their own, it would be a public course. But if you're looking at setting up an in-house panel, uh, we come to you and we do a whole package for you in uh, within your organization. Then you're going to want to get some experience. So once you've done your training, you've got a certificate there on the wall looking great. You need to go and get some experience. So I'll start with the freelancers this time. What I suggest you do if you're trying to come into this field cold is look at what existing connections you have and what existing expertise you have. So if you've worked in accountancy for 20 years and then you train in mediation, I would suggest you look at connections within the accountancy industry. I would suggest you speak to people who are likely to make referrals in connection with disputes to do with accountants and their clients or accountants and HMRC. Look at what you know. Take your connections you've got. Look at where there are already open doors and exploit those connections and exploit your own expertise. So take another example of somebody we trained some years ago who's from the publishing industry. And she said, where am I going to get work? And we said, well, is there any conflict in the publishing industry? Well, yes, she said. So we suggested that she speak to publishers that she knows, to writers that she knows, to agents that she knows, um, which she did. And her own expertise in that area means that she can talk the language. So you may be from an industry sector where you already talk the language, you know where the conflict is going to be, where the disputes are going to pop up. Um, and the, the punchline to that story was we got a postcard from the, the trainee about 18 months ago saying she's doing really well. She'd actually moved. Uh, she was in Italy um, and she'd taken on somebody else to work with her because she was getting so many referrals. So she she trained up. She'd used this idea of exploiting the connections she had and the expertise that she's got. Uh, and she's doing very well as a mediator within the publishing industry. Good idea to start with a free case or two. Uh, if you can show people that mediation works, take a referral or two. Um, do it well, see it through to a conclusion. Uh, you've actually got something there to demonstrate to people uh, that it really works. Get yourself a good website. Don't need to say too much about that if you're a freelancer. Uh, Co-mediation can help when you're getting, trying to get started. So if you're, again, if you're going from zero, uh, it can be good to work alongside someone else so that you can, um, you know, co-mediate with them, buddy up with them, give and receive feedback, uh, really get your skills embedded. Um, it can, it's a really good way to get started. And I say promote mediation and market yourself is a slightly cryptic message. But what I mean by that is you're going to be marketing yourself because you're there offering a mediation service saying to people, hey, I've got this great thing. Uh, but promoting mediation, what I mean by that is that a lot of people don't really get what it is. There are lots of myths and legends about mediation. Um, people think it's something like arbitration. People think it's um, some form of counseling. Unfortunately, the word looks a bit like meditation, which gives it a bad press. Uh, but what you need to do is both promote the idea of mediation and, and what the, the tool is, but also market yourself in order that it's you that gets the bookings. So, you know, a bit of work there. Uh, what I say to most freelancers training with us, you know, is that it's a good idea if you have a think about these points before you even go on your training course. Think about who you're going to talk to about getting referrals. Where have you got some open doors already? Who have you got in your industry sector who would be likely to make referrals? Think about what expertise you've got that you could exploit in a particular industry sector. And then look at look at doing a couple of free cases. Um, think about who you can partner up with, which is often somebody on the training course as it happens. And then look at how you're going to promote things. An experience for in-house services. Well, what I suggest you do very much uh, in the same vein as if you were working outside of an organization, you need to do a lot of internal publicity. You need to promote the service internally. You need to publicize the service internally. You need to make sure that people know it's available and know what it is as well. Very good idea internally is to appoint a mediation champion. So an individual, sometimes HR, sometimes senior management, who is going to champion mediation, who's going to go to senior uh, management team meetings and chew people's ear and say we need to, we need to be using mediation more make sure that your trades unions are on board make sure that you've got your 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 welfare and your equality unit on board so that everybody is thinking okay mediation might work for this so get a champion in there somebody who can fly the flag for mediation and make sure people really know about it run some awareness raising events internally that can be a really good idea to um uh, we can help with that as well mock mediations are a really good thing uh, co-mediation again have your mediators working in pairs 
And I would strongly suggest that to gain your early experience and really embed your mediation skills, that you get your mediators together as a group from time to time to hear about cases they've worked on, to reflect on the work they've done. Um, it's, it's an essential part of working well as a mediator is that we work reflectively. And a kind of a consultative support group or case supervision group is a great way to do that. And of course, in-house services, you've spent money on training, you've got people spending time away from their day jobs. You need to evaluate your service, make sure it's working, make sure you're justifying that investment. So a very quick skip there over how you would gain experience either as an individual freelancer or if you're working with an in-house service. And of course, gaining the credibility is really important. You will get people saying to you, so who are you then? What do you know that I don't know? Uh, I encounter people within organizations who say, well, I've been, I've been managing people for 20 years. Um, I'm a natural mediator. What can you do that I can't do? So there's a, there is a credibility element. There's a need for you to uh, be able to have something to show to people to prove that they can believe in the service that you've got to offer. Simple answer, I would suggest you get accredited mediator status with UK Mediation. It's it's the standard. Uh, we, we accredit mediators. We're an accrediting body for mediators. We um, don't just do it internally. We have external um, accreditation for your training as well. So the external accreditation is with an awarding body who are responsible to Ofqual. And our training units are on the database where A-levels and degrees sit. So proper qualification, but also uh, a code of practice. So we suggest a code of practice that's been developed over the years, which gives your potential clients assurances of the quality of what you're doing, the integrity of your practice, and the accountability. There's a complaints procedure in there as well. Um, and the last thing is really... When you've got those things in place, when you've got your accredited mediator status, when you're working to the code of practice, try and show people uh, what it is that you can do rather than tell. If you can demonstrate with three cases, if you can do mock mediations, if you can do a, um, you know, some good work, or if you can present at uh, SMT meetings, if you can go out there and show people what it is that you've got to offer, uh, that's a great way to gain the credibility. What we can do to help just in these last uh, uh, few minutes, um, we do the level four training, which leads to accredited mediator status uh, for freelancers or individuals, um, or if your organization just wants to train one or two people. We've got public courses all around the place. We're going to Gibraltar very soon. Looking forward to meeting our uh, Gibraltarian friends quite shortly. Uh, we're in Leeds in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have another course in London next week. Uh, we do a Manchester course every year, and I've put et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to list every town we train in, but um, we do public courses, a lot of different places throughout the year. Uh, and we also do the in-house courses, the second bullet there, uh, with a full support and setup package. So wherever you are, whatever your organization is, we'll come to you. We will provide everything, including the training, that you need to get set up with a working mediation service. We can provide the case supervision and consultative support, which might be individuals or it might be groups. And within organizations, we tend to come in and run a group. Um, and the other thing I was talking about, show not tell, is that if you're having to sell the idea of mediation or if you want to uh, you know, join a group, um, we'd be very pleased to provide a live foreign theater style mock mediation session. So we do them at public venues. We have one um, scheduled in at the moment in London. Um, or we can come to your place and do it. So there's something we can talk about the detail of. So there's some of the things that we can do to help you out as well. So a bit of a dash through what it involves to, um, to become a workplace mediator. I've said something about what mediation is, how it's provided, uh, what you need to do to get the training and the experience and the credibility to become a workplace mediator. And I've, I've put something in there about the joys of doing it as well. Um, I'll invite questions now. I'll invite any comments. Um, just uh, while we're doing that, just while we're waiting, there's a few other web webinars coming up. Um, there's one on how mediation works, which is me talking about our unique model of mediation. So we have looked in great detail at the um, sort of the underlying psychology of conflict and how it uh, plays out in mediation. And we'll be doing a, a webinar on that on 20th of October. And um, we've got another one on commercial mediation a bit later in the year, uh, which is about financial and contractual disputes. Uh, more than the interpersonal disputes. And we've also got one coming up on medical and health mediation. This is in December, um, especially talking about how to get better conversations going uh, within healthcare settings. And first one next year will be about preventing homelessness through mediation. So another webinar coming up there about homelessness and about uh, particularly 
uh, working with families so that uh, youngsters don't end up on the streets. So a few more webinars there. Um, so just while we're taking any questions, um, I'm going to put our contact details up there, including the international number. I know we've got a few friends on today from outside the UK. Um, so this is our uh, this is our contact details. So I'm just going to take a, a look now and see if we've got any questions. So a question from somebody who says, what is the core content on the course? Great question. Thank you very much. The core content on the course, first of all, um, is about how mediation compares to other forms of solving disputes. And we go into some detail there about what's different about mediation. Um, the other content is leading quite quickly into the skills, the skills of active listening, the skills of reframing, the skills of building rapport with people, and especially looking at when we get people together in the room, the skills of being able to manage a conversation between two people who um, potentially might want to hit each other. So it's about managing disruptive behavior, it's about keeping order in a mediation and how to keep a conversation moving forwards based on people's needs. Uh, and based on the frame of a future focus rather than getting into too much about blame, fault, and responsibility. So it's a very practical course um, uh, that we, it's Joanna who's asked the question. It's a very practical course, Joanna. Um, so we very quickly get into case simulations. We get you actually doing mediation on the course, um, and the trainer will give you quite detailed feedback about your use of the skills. Um, very practical learning by doing experiential learning approach. What we want you to do but to be able to do at the end of the course is to walk out of there and feel entirely confident and competent that you could go on and set up run and conclude mediation sessions so very much an active learning uh, skills-based learning uh, that leaves you in a position where you're ready to start working as a mediator uh, i've got a question here from janine thanks janine are things usually resolved with one meeting uh, yeah i mean the figures are that um, about 80% of disputes will get resolved in a day. So a typical structure of a workplace mediation would be meet the two individuals in the morning uh, for about an hour and a quarter, hour and a half each. And then if they're ready to, we can get them together in the afternoon for a joint, a joint session. And that joint session will go on typically for the whole of the afternoon. So anything from two or three hours up to um, you know a bit longer. Um, and the success rate which is very, very consistent. I've seen research from all around the world on success rate of mediation is about 80%. So in around four out of five cases or better, uh, you'll get a resolution in a single day. And question from Jared. Jared, thank you very much. Um, are the slides available after the webinar? Yes, they are. We'll send them to you. And uh, they'll also be up on the website. Um, so they can be accessed by anybody on there as well. So, uh, just for a change, I haven't gone over time. Um, do we look at power on the course, says Joanna? Yes, we do. And it's a, it's a, a very, very important thing because uh, power runs through the whole of disputing behavior. Um, there's often knowledge power. There can be um, power due to people's gender, ability status. Uh, we do look at power on the course. Um, and that is something that we do go into um, as part of the training. I think leveling the power balance leveling the playing field within a mediation is a key thing and it can often be the first time that people have experienced um, that sense of feeling at the same power base as their colleague um, which gives them the inclination to negotiate to feel entitled um, to ask what it is they need from the other party and certainly to express any resentments so yeah the work on power is very very important thank you for that question um okay it's uh, 12 45 it's Friday. It's time to end our webinar. I thank you very, very much, everybody, for uh, your attention and for your comments and questions. Very helpful. Um, look forward to seeing you on one of our other webinars. Do keep in touch. Still got the screen up there. Um, follow us on Twitter. Have a look at our Facebook page. You can uh, connect with me on uh, LinkedIn. Um, take a look at our website. Um, or if you've got any further questions, give us a call or drop us an email. Okay. So I'll finish there at 12.45 and uh, wish you all a very nice weekend thanks for your attention and uh, best of luck